is a board certified uh, in infection prevention and epidemiology, and Dr. Preeta Kondal, uh, the medical director of infection prevention for Providence St. Joseph Health's Southwest service area. And I just have to say, these have been amazing partners, very, very approachable and really workable. So with that, Dr. Kondal, I am going to um, turn it over to you and uh, welcome you all. Thank you, Kristen, so much. Um, it, I, we are both very excited to be here and talk a little bit about what COVID is and some of the recommendations and why they're there. Um, if it is okay, can I share my screen? Yes, um, go ahead and click the present now button in the bottom right. Okay. I am trying to find. I apologize. Are you, were you seeing my screen at that time? I don't I know. I cannot see your screen yet. No. Okay. Do you see in the bottom right corner um, an option that is labeled present now? Yes, I do see that, but I can't share. I don't, the share button is not highlighted. Um, is it something you could send to me and I can, I'm happy to present for you? Sure, sorry, we should have probably done a little bit. When, um, when you click on the present now button, you'll have to, decide are you going to share your entire screen or a certain tab in your window or a certain application and so you have to click that one of those options first and then it should i, I okay. did I put share your entire screen and oh now it's allowing me to do so okay it looks like it's working now okay and i just have to pull up my stuff which Sorry. Can't seem to find it now. Um, sorry. Okay, can you guys see that? Yes, we can see. Okay, sorry. Sorry for a little bit of technical difficulty. Um, all right, I'm gonna talk a little about kind of what to, what do you need to know about COVID-19? And um, like Kristen said, I'm an infectious disease physician and also do infection prevention um, at the hospital as well as the clinic area. So kind of some of the learning objectives that we wanted to talk about was basic information about coronavirus, some of the personal actions that can be taken um, for safety at your, for your work, for yourself, as well as the children, um, and how to interact with them safely, and then to minimize transmission as much as possible from each other as well as the environment. So I wanted to start off with just kind of looking at, you know, I think it's, um, always good to look to see where we stand in, with, in regards to the COVID. You know, worldwide, we've had over 87 million cases with almost 2 million deaths, which is a significant amount. U.S. alone has 21.3 million. And you can see kind of where we stand in regards to some of the other top nations. So we are, unfortunately, this is not the top bracket that we want to be in, but we are the top Per, um, nation worldwide in the number of cases um, as well as deaths. And then for Washington, just kind of going down, we have over 266,000 cases and almost th over 3,500 deaths. 
Pierce County itself is almost 30,000 and almost 300 debt. So, um, and it's it's one thing to look at those numbers and I'm gonna just show some graphs and this is for Pierce County um, and looking at where, where we are at and where we're going. And that's probably not a trend that we want to go towards, but um, I think we, probably have been a little bit more lax in um, and that's as a we as our society has been uh, a little bit lax on some of the measures that I'm about to talk to about because we actually did pretty good up until here and then there's a exponential increase in the number of cases um, and this is kind of similar graph for the number of deaths again this is specifically for Pierce County not looking at Washington but just looking at Pierce County itself. So some of the basics, kind of having to know what the impact is, I think it's good to know what the basics of COVID-19 are. So, you know, coronavirus, we've heard about it before. It's uh, There were six known types of coronaviruses, but then this was a novel coronavirus that was discovered at the end of 2019 in Wuhan, China. The other four types, so four of the types that we have have been around for uh, years and, and they cause more common cold, mild respiratory symptoms, but there's been two that have been discovered in the last, you know, within the last 20 years that tend to have more severe infections. So the first one, and the reason we call this SARS-CoV-2 is there is a similar coronavirus, SARS-CoV-1, that was initially discovered in 2003 and that, that had a small span, didn't spread as a pandemic at that time. Um, and then now we have the SARS-CoV-2, which is the COVID-19. And then also along with that, the second one is MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus, also kind of came on over the last 10 years, present mostly in the Middle East. Um, and that one kind of hopped over from the camel to humans. And that is that is in place. And it's, it's more regional. It has not spread um, worldwide. Partly, I think, is because the MERS virus, even though it's highly contagious, it is purely airborne versus COVID. 19, which we'll talk a little bit about, is more droplet transmission. It is still highly contagious. Um, you know, median re reproductive number, how many people can one infected person infect is 2.4. And that this is for COVID-19. Comparatively, influenza is lower at 0.9 to 2.1, and measles is much higher. And, the re and it's from 12 to 18. So one infected person with measles can infect 12 to 18 people. And the reason is that one is purely airborne. That virus is spread via airborne, so if it gets into the air, there's a multitude of people that it can infect. And so, and the other part is kind of the notable variant. So we've had, um, you know, this COVID-19 that we know of, and every virus, as it replicates, it's normal to have um, you know, slight mutation here or there because not everything is perfect. And majority of the mutations have been uh, not, they don't change how the virus functions. But more recently, um, you know, as you guys may have heard, there have been a couple strains where there is a change. And that has to do with how the virus binds onto uh, the receptors in the human lung. So ACE2 receptors in the human lung. And so in the UK, they named this one um, I, you know, not easy to say, but SARS-CoV-2 uh, variant of concern is the VOC, and they go by 2020-12 because it was discovered in 2020 in December. So that's kind of the name. Um, it has, I guess it's not easy to remember, or people call it the B.1.1.7. And then South Africa has had another variant. And what we have discovered is actually this is independent of the one in United Kingdom. And so, so again, this virus has been replicating on its own. So this may be kind of the evolution that it's going towards that these mutations are arising. At this point, it does not seem to be any more deadly. You know, it does not um, seem to have increased risk, except that it is more contagious, so it is more widespread, and that has been the concern again in UK. 
So incubation for this infection is two to 14 days after exposure. Most cases do occur within the four to seven day period, but there's obviously, you know, outliers on either side. Um, rarely, and I say rarely, because these are case reports that have been written. So this is probably one or two worldwide that is up to 25 days. But again, that is very uncommon. And as far as the spectrum of illness goes, that is quite broad. It can be anywhere from mild to, or I should say completely asymptomatic to mild symptoms to critical illness. We have learned, I think initially when this whole pandemic started, we thought maybe five to 10% of cases were asymptomatic, but more recent data suggests that up to 40% of people can be asymptomatic. And just because you're asymptomatic does not mean you're not infectious. So you can still cause infection to unsuspecting um, high-risk populations. And 50% of the transmission that has gone on, again, this is US data, is based on these asymptomatic or what we call pre-symptomatic or prior to symptom onset. We know that the viral load is the highest 48 hours prior to you developing symptoms. So prior to those 48 hours, you may feel great, but you are still at high risk for transmitting the virus. So that's about 50%. So the combination of the asymptomatic folks and then the pre-symptomatic folks, it, it equates to about 50% of the transmission throughout the United States. So what are the symptoms? I think you have all seen this, heard this uh, multiple times. These are the screening questions that get asked multiple times as, as you know, you're going to work or maybe going to a hospital setting is cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, fevers, chills, muscle, body aches, vomiting, new loss of taste or smell because it can bind onto the nerves. So you get that. So these are the known symptoms. Obviously, there's people who have some of the unusual stuff, but these are the more common symptoms if you're going to have symptoms. And again, they range from mild to severe forms of this. I think I want to spend quite a bit of time talking about modes of transmission. I think it's very important to understand how this is spread so that we can protect ourselves, protect the kids, protect our families, and go from there. Um, and, you know, having done this, we've been seeing patients in the hospital setting since March. And so some of the one things that so it was most important to understand how it spread. And early on, we were still learning, you know, I think some of the confusion that came on early on is you you presumed what it was, and you acted that way. But as more data came on, you you had to change, you had to adapt to that. But I think we have a better understanding now than we did nine months ago, how this is spread, what we can do to protect ourselves. So, you know, you have the infected individual that's here, um, and like I said, primarily this infection is spread via droplet spread. So they cough, they sneeze, they talk, they sing, you know, whatever they're doing, which creates droplets and talking does create droplets. But most of these droplets are greater than five micrometer uh, in diameter and they travel that kind of that six feet um, the distance that we talk about, they they all drop within that um, distance. So, but then there's very few. Sometimes there's these small droplet nuclei, which are less than the droplet size, and they can travel farther. And so, you know, there's there's discussion more the last several months that this is airborne. It's not. It's not per se airborne, because if it's truly airborne like measles, we would have much higher rate of infection. But what it is true is there can be droplet nuclei which remain in the air a little bit longer, a little bit farther than the six feet that we talk about. So that's kind of where that airborne transmission that we say um, can happen. And this is the susceptible individual. But again, majority of the infection is via that droplet. Um, and then there's always that direct contact. So someone sneezes on your hand and then you touch your face or your mouth or whatnot and can do it. That those that's another route. The other one that, you know, we have worried about and is that indirect contact. So someone else coughed at on um, something for, you know, hours ago. How long is it going to stay on that? And how how is that going to lead to spread? That one is still, yes, there I think there is a chance that can happen, but that's not 
primary source of infection. Um, I think if it was, or if it was a major part of it, I think we would have more cases. So, you know, not disregarding that it can't happen that way, but that's a much smaller proportion of infection that's there. So what are the risk factors? Oh, this one is the old one. Um, um, I guess, I'm sorry. Um, this talks about this, I'm trying to if you go to the next one, kind of the risk factors are related to age. And that slide didn't come up, but what the age is, is they what they have done is looked comparatively. So CDC looked at 18 through 29 year olds. I'm sorry, I don't have the pictorial for that. That one didn't come out as well, but they looked at 18 to 29 year olds as those are felt to be the healthiest of our population. And they compared that to see what is the risk factor as of hospitalization of the infection on various scales of the age. So you have kids that are 10 to 17, kids that are less than 10 years old, and the lowest risk in comparison is the kids less than 10 years old. And then you have a a little bit increased risk um, than the, the less than 10 year old in the 10 to 17 year old comparatively. But regardless, it's less risk in the lower age groups versus as you go up every decade beyond that, you have an increased risk of um, getting the infection, getting hospitalized with this um, and dying from that. And then in addition to age, um, the, the highest other risk factors have been race and ethnicity. And so they have looked at that in comparison to Caucasian, every other um, race or ethnicity as at higher risk. And so, and that's not just, uh, you know, hospitalization, but including death and some can be pretty significant. So those need to be recognized in that regards as well. Um, you know, risk factors for severe disease, we've always said anybody with comorbidities or underlying conditions are at increased risk. And this is just a small list. You know, there's various other things. I just wanted to kind of bring up some of the more common things um, that you can think of, um, but these are just more common, but the list, the list is there. Anybody with comorbidities, comorbidities can be, or underlying conditions can be at risk. There's other risk factors that I think they have looked at, again, specific groups. And you saw some of the racial and ethnic minority groups in comparison that there's a significant increase in those. But then also nursing and long-term care facilities. And we know that's where the outbreak started in Kirkland. Um, and that has continued on um, rural communities. And that may be lack of the health care or, or that may be there or access to it because it may be 30 to 40 miles before you have a major hospital that you need to go to. Pregnancy and breastfeeding women, people with disabilities, people experiencing homelessness. Again, people where you can't um, do the measures like masking, social distancing, those are the, are the ones that are at high risk. So what do we need to do to prevent the spread of COVID-19? I think we've, we've, we've kind of focused on top seven things you can do. And these, and, and we'll talk about that this is not do one and not the other. This is doing every single one of these. If we do all seven of these, we can be successful. And again, coming, bringing in our experience from healthcare, this is what we're held accountable for. Every day that I go to work, I am held accountable for well, for every single one of those things. And you know we're in a very high risk setting where we're seeing COVID patients, we're seeing other patients, and yet we can be safe. We haven't had very many transmissions within from patients to uh, providers. And that includes all type of providers, nurses, physicians, you know, CNAs who are up close and personal with these patients. Um, what we have seen is we see transmission in the break rooms or within staff because we lose that barrier. We don't follow these seven things when we are out with our friends or when we are having lunch or in, and we go, let's go out for lunch. I work with you, so it's less risky. So um, I wanna emphasize that these seven things should be applied at all times, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, whether it's when you're out and about. Um, and so, and I'll, we'll go a little bit into more detail into all of these. 
So hand hygiene, that has been the foundation of infection prevention, you know, starting in 1800s, um, that you need to clean your hands between patients and, and doing from one thing to the other. So that is, again, applies here. It's the most important thing that can be done to prevent the spread of germs and to stay healthy. The thing I think that most people, most people know this, it's just the 20 seconds, that's a long time of kind of rubbing your hands for 20 seconds, soap and water, um, and you know, whatever you need to do, sing happy birthday, count to 20, whatever it takes to make sure that you get that 20 seconds in um, using your soap and water is beneficial. Um, at, if possible, that should be the primary method. Regular soap is just fine. You don't need anything antibacterial or anything fancy like that. Obviously, it's not feasible to have soap and water everywhere, so hand sanitizing with an alcohol-based scrub or hand rub is, is pretty good as well, but you also have to make sure that it is at least 60% alcohol. There's many hand, they label as hand sanitizers, but they may not have that 60%, so make sure you notice that there's a 60% alcohol within that um, hand rub. And if your hands are visibly dirty, don't use that. And you use that until your hands are completely dry. Um, you know, a lot of times we, we get a big amount and shake that off. So try and get a smaller amount, and but try to rub it in until um, that's completely dry. So, you know, there's always what's a good time that we must hand wash and, and we can do hand sanitizing other times. So eating, whether it's preparing food, eating, um, it's important that you wash your hands. Uh, you know, alcohol, again, obviously, if you don't have anything else, it's it, the hand rub is, is a good alternative. But if you can, before eating, preparing food, it's important. If you're caring for anybody sick, that's important. Caring for pets, it's important. Anything that's on your hands and is dirty is important to clean with hand and water going to the bathroom soap and water um, and then if you're taking out the trash where it's acceptable and good to use hand sanitizer is you know if you're out in public healthcare visits um, cover after sneezing or blowing your nose touching your face you know after if you need to adjust your mask or whatnot and if you're again um, grocery shopping and whatnot um, it's helpful to do the hand sanitizer so the next is is social distancing um, or physical distancing you know it again we talked about kind of what is the mode of transmission it is that droplet and possibly the droplet nuclei so um, it's for prolonged periods of time so you need enough viral load to for it to be infectious you know um, if you're in a crowded area where there's a lot of people and if even if a few people um, may be infected that that's close contact and you're in an area where this could be an issue where the droplets are hanging out the droplet nuclei are hanging out so you got to make sure that you have that social distance um, two arms length if six feet is hard to remember um, you could do that both indoor and outdoor. So if you're outside, um, you know, you still have to maintain that six feet distance. Um, do not gather in groups and maybe have visual cues. And as we were doing our walkthroughs with a lot of the schools, you guys have done a great job of, you know, there was little caterpillars in certain areas or little markers in um, on the floor or whatnot. Those are great. Those are great reminders for the kids, for the adults to make sure they can peer check each other to make sure be like, oh, you're not on the caterpillar or whatever um, bug that you may have. Um, avoid crowded places. Um, again, that kind of goes with why are we limiting? Why are we saying to limit the number of students in a classroom is the more people you have, the less ventilation there may be. They, it'd be harder to maintain that six foot distance. So limit that, that number. And obviously, you know, if you're six, stay home. And then the other part is mass though. That's the number is four in knowing what, what in People say, well, initially we said no masks, and, and part of it was we didn't know. Um, this is a novel. Go back to this is a novel. A year ago, this it 
it existed, but we didn't know much about this virus at that time. But as we have learned more, masks are critical in preventing this infection, and especially when social distancing can be difficult. And again, in a school setting, even though we can try and control everything, there are going to be moments where that six feet is not going to be maintained. There are going to be moments where you have to be able to um, do things which, you know, for the kids or for yourself or whatnot, where where that happens. And sometimes we do that even at grocery stores. So this is not, but having that mask is another step of protection that you can have. And the key is it needs to cover both your mouth and nose. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a human nature or I've been to stores, even in the hospital setting. A lot of times people's masks are kind of below their nose and you have to, you know, at least in the hospital setting, we can remind them, hey, cover your nose. But that may be something that you do as a peer check to each other, uh, make sure that or have visual cues that you can do that where people don't have the mask sliding down below their nose and have it on um, the right way. So it's meant to protect you from kind of putting out your droplets and from others to reaching as well. So if you have a mask on, so there's source control that's doing it, and then you're also protecting yourself. And for that reason, um, CDC does recommend that not mask with exhalation valves or vents. And the reason is that you're not doing source control when that's happening because you're having a mask, you're protecting yourself. However, if for any reason you may be that asymptomatic person, your droplets can be coming out. And a lot of times when they go through these valves, they actually become those droplet nuclei. So they become smaller because there's a filter usually there. And a filter may fill not filter out completely, you know, they may filter out the bigger droplets, but those smaller um, airborne nu droplet nuclei are able to get through. And then avoid using bandanas and neck gaiters. And initially, um, you know, neck gaiters, CDC recommended absolutely not. However, now they have, have said, you know, they have to be at least two layers. Um, and it may be initially they were all one layer and, and that, that was what some of the studies were done. But those have to be at least two layers. But I think some of the challenges for neck gaiters, again, with little ones are that they may slide down or um, so just just be mindful and that may be something to consider. And this is should not be a substitute for social distancing. Again, social distancing has to be in conjunction with the masks. Um, you know, with the children under two, it is not recommended that they wear masks or someone who has other respiratory reasons that they can't wear a mask. And obviously if they're not, um, if they're incapacitated or don't understand that if they get short of breath then they need to be able to um, take the mask down, then they should not be wearing a mask. So, you know, like I said, there's there's more data out as to why masks are protected. So this I included the link as to the scientific paper if someone ever wants to go back and read it. And I pulled out only for coronavirus. So what they looked at in this is so if you look on here, the nasal swab and then the throat swab, the they're swabbing these patients who are symptomatic and seeing what the viral load is in the nasal swab and the throat swab. So, and you know, 10 to the 10 is very high viral load. Um, even our PCR machines detect, um, you know, depending on the machines, it varies, but most detect down to about 100 um, copies per mil of the virus. But 10 to the 10 copies of virus is pretty significant. So these are pretty high viral loads. So then they look at how much of it is spewed out, um, you know, at six feet. And so this is looking at, at that social distancing without a mask. So you definitely have droplets that contain the virus that are out there. Same, same person who is ill and is wearing a mask essentially nothing. There's really nothing coming out. And you look at aerosol particles, so those droplet nuclei, same thing. There's definitely some that is present. This is without a mask. And if someone puts on their mask, even though they're symptomatic, even though they have the infection, and some of it may be significantly high numbers of viral load, absolutely nothing that was detected. So, you know, um, that this this has been uh, very eye opening that we need to be wearing masks um, at all times. So even if you're asymptomatic, you can prevent that spread. 
So mask do's and don'ts. Um, you know, there's been in the last eight, nine, ten months that we've been doing the mask, there's been a variety of ways and that I've seen the masks. Um, this is on the top is the only right way of putting it on. I I I'm this is not unusual. We've seen this, but this is not what should be done. Um, you're putting yourself at risk, um, you're putting others at risk as that's happening. So these are all what not to do and then you know we always talk about you know when removing a face mask but also when putting it on do hand hygiene and put it on and then you clean your hands remove it from from the loops on the outside or straps um, and then do hand hygiene again so kind of tips for reducing kind of staying out of that hot spot and getting into the safe spot so it's not just one or the other doing a combination of things can put you in the hot spot and put you in the safe spot so decrease your risk prioritize outdoor spaces wearing masks and keeping your distance um, and then you know covering cough and sneezes this has been the respiratory hygiene um, 101 from you know learning the little ones that always cover your cough and sneezes if you don't if you can do it in your elbow that's best or if you have a tissue and if you use a tissue throw it in the trash make sure you either wash your hands if that's available or hand sanitize um, with the 60% alcohol and then cleaning and disinfection. I think that I'm um, just going to provide the basics of that is on a consistent basis um, is helpful in preventing the spread to both staff, to students. High touch surfaces must be cleaned and disinfected on a more frequent basis throughout the business day. And I know you've had a phenomenal team of folks that I've been working to get what that is. So, you know, um, work with them to know exactly and and there's janitors that are doing the the high touch surfaces so there's a plan that has been in place um, for each school and how that's done again if things are dirty clean them first and then use the disinfectant so what what is the difference between the three you know I think we get into the habit of talking about these all the time, not realizing that people may not know. So cleaning, again, that soap and water on surfaces that have visible, visible dirt and grime. It leaves germs behind, does not kill them. Um, and, and you use it to take off that visible dirt or anything that may be dirty. Sanitizing, so using products to lower the germ to a safe level. We use that quite often in um, kind of the food service, scoots, service industry and then also just um, it's done until the surface is visibly clean disinfection actually uses products on surfaces to kill germs it actually requires a wet time that's probably something you all have heard multiple times um, to be effective and that's what the chemical takes to kill your your bacteria and viruses and it all depends on which product is being used and that can be anywhere from three to ten minutes again depending on which product is being used and the contact time again is that area has to remain wet on that surface and if you need to grab more of the product to do that, you should do that so that that full time frame is uh, wet. And then again, this was just a tool. You can get this off of the EPA website um, as to what to do, kind of the safe and effective ways of disinfecting. Um, you know, check your product is EPA approved. Um, that has to be that has been done. You know, I think that has been verified. Um, reading the directions, especially if you're the ones that's doing some of the cleaning or um, pre-clean the surface if it's visibly dirty and follow the contact time. And depending on the chemical, you know, you may need to wear gloves or wash your hands following that. But uh, I know some of the products that are being used are the hydrogen peroxide base, which are very safe that do not require gloves. Um, so I think that, again, it all depends on the product. This is not everything has to follow, but what product that you're using and obviously lock it up. Um, and you don't want it in the wrong hand. So, and then monitoring your health. I think that every day as, as we go, I, as I go to work, kind of make sure, do I have any of the symptoms? Do I feel off or is anything going on? If it is, then it may be saying, hey, maybe I need to take the day and see if this is, you know, just allergies or something else. Cause we've had, you know, that happens. Um, you get exposed one way or the other and, and you may just be like, oh, it's a little bit of congestion. It may be allergies, but think about what you've done. Um, um, that may put you at high risk. So, you know, if you've been out in a big crowd and you have 
kind of congestion, it may not be allergies. It may be something that, that needs to be looked into. And then temperature taking, you know, we're going to be doing that with all the students as they are doing their health screen and, and doing that. So that should be done with the staff as well is, but we always say don't do it within 30, 30 minutes of exercising or taking fever reducing medicines because obviously that will alter um, your readings. So, and then stopping the spread of germs. You know, there's there's multiple things that we need to do to do this. This is not going to be one thing. Is again, social distancing, physical distancing, covering your cough and sneeze, wearing a mask, not touching your face, kind of cleaning and disinfecting as needed, staying home when you're sick, and Washington, washing and hand sanitizing as needed. Why do we say all of that? It's it's because it's multiple layers that are needed to cause the success. And so there's also kind of, we have to use this Swiss cheese that we talk about in the respiratory pandemic defense that we have is there's some personal responsibilities that all of us have to take. And then there's shared responsibilities. And it's just not one thing that does it. It's a combination of things because none of these are perfect by themselves. So it's a combination of things that prevents an infection. So, you know, it's it's not just physical distancing and staying home when you're sick. It's not just masks. It's not just hand hygiene. You could do all three and you could still be at risk. You have to avoid touching your face, avoid crowds, you know, um, when you do feel sick, you have that sensitive testing and tracing that's there. Ventilation, Ill air filtration, and John has done a great job of kind of making sure that that's, um, that's there for you all. Kind of what financial support is there? And I think that's the government that, that is putting aside money for schools to, so that they can open and have all of these measures. And then, uh, you know, quarantine and isolation and vaccines. So all of these together have to work together and all of us have to be doing our personal responsibilities and then along with the shared one that that um, that are available to make this be successful. So speaking of vaccines, I think there's been a lot of questions um, what vaccines are available. So currently we have two vaccines who have had what we call EUA emergency use authorization. And that is the Pfizer vaccine and then the Moderna vaccine. They're both mRNA vaccines and I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, and they're looking at the perfusion spike transcript um, or the spike protein that this coronavirus has. Each of them require two doses. Pfizer is 21 days and Moderna is 28 days. I will say both Angie and I have had, and both I've, Angie had the Pfizer vaccine and I had the Moderna vaccine. Um, so, you know, they're available. Their efficacy is very similar, 95 to 94.5%. And um, looking at kind of how effective it is. So every, anybody who was symptomatic from COVID-19. There were about 170 cases of that. 162 of the 170 for the Pfizer were in the placebo group and eight were in the vaccine group. And of those 10 had severe cases, um, nine were in the placebo, one was in the vaccine. Um, and then again, efficacy is, is great for both of these. For Moderna, they had 90 cases of symptomatic and all of them were in the um, uh, in or 90 in the symptomatic and five in the vaccine group and all of the severe disease was in the placebo group. So everybody asks, what does messenger RNA vaccine means? There's concern that could this be, um, you know, changing our DNA or affecting any of that. So I wanted to show this. So answer to that is no. What the vaccine is, is it so why it has to be so cold for both Pfizer, it has to be ultra cold. And then for Moderna, it has to be cold too, is because both of these are in a lipid coat, which requires that cold um, so that it can stay intact. Otherwise it will break down, degrade. So when is there or over a period of time? So this is the vaccine that gets injected the lipid code uses your own cell. So it is using your cell, but it's not going towards the nucleus. It is not affecting the DNA. It is just using the part. So the mRNA is released. The ribosome, which is the protein within your cell, um, uses that mRNA and makes the spike protein. As that spike protein is made, the cell releases it out. And then your body 
says, hey, this is foreign, and then it reacts to it. It brings it back in, and then it starts the whole process of the antibody mediated immunity. So that's kind of the way it's doing. It's not, again, it's not doing anything to the DNA that we have. It's not incorporating anywhere. It's just using the protein, the ribosome that we have within our cell to create the protein and then allowing our bodies to make that cell mediated, um, antibody mediated immunity. And so, you know, I this is the data for Pfizer, but Moderna's data is exactly the same, meaning, so this blue line is the incidence of COVID in patients who got placebo. This is who got the vaccine. The inset here is after one dose. So that's the reason why we say that these are all two dose vaccines because there's some protection but it's not as drastic as after two doses. So these are days after dose one. Um, and around for Pfizer, around 21 days is when you get that at second dose and you see a huge difference in how effective it is. And then kind of looking at what is the vaccine rollout for Washington? Um, you know, I think there has been some concerns that some folks may not be getting it until April. I think what may change is the timeline the grouping likely will not change there has been a lot of work um, at the health department level coming up with groupings and kind of initially the high risk uh, healthcare workers first responders long-term care facility and others that in healthcare setting that are high risk are have gotten it and many and a lot of this is based on maybe counties um, and are moving to that second b1 phase which is anybody that's older than 70 all 50 years in multi-generation households, and then it's moving to the next one, and you guys can read that is, and teachers um, are included, K through 12 teachers and, and school staff are part of that B2, so that, that phase, again, timing of when that phase is going to happen may depend on your county, may depend on uh, their factors, but kind of this is the grouping to keep in mind. So I, you know, I, I don't want you to focus on the, the, the Feb January, February, but these groups are not going to change, but you may go into the next group sooner. And then um, the pandemic will eventually end. Vaccines are bringing light at the end of, the of a long tunnel. Um, precaution measures need to remain in place uh, even after vaccination. We, we would need to get to herd immunity before we say, hey, some of these measures can stop. And what is herd immunity? I think it all depends on how the virus is transmitted. It can be anywhere from 50 to 90% of people either have the infection or have had the infection or are immune to it or they've had the vaccine. So I don't anticipate that that's gonna happen anytime soon. Uh, it may take months before that happens. Um, and I don't know if anybody is a Back to the Future fan, but we should never go back to 2020. Um, here are some of the references for what uh, some of the uh, information is coming from. I encourage you to go and um, take a look at these. And then I think that's it for um, this portion. I think the next is going to be the Q&A. All right, well, thank you very much for that information. Uh, Heidi and I have some questions that were submitted. Uh, and we'll go ahead and just kick that off. And if we have some extra time, we'll open up the chat and uh, let some other questions come through. But the first one we got is, um, with colder temperatures, we were told to allow students to enter the classroom after asking attestation questions and applying hand sanitizer, then take their temperatures after they've been in the room for five minutes. Is this acceptable? Yes, you know, again, if again with the colder temperature, the the kids or if their forehead temperature is probably going to be colder, um, or if they have a hat on, it may be hotter. So um, I think that's very reasonable because you are doing the attestation. Make sure that they're not feeling sick before they enter the room, and once they're in the room, you're confirming that they don't have a fever, so that they can go on throughout their day. Thank you. Uh, second question is, now that it is well understood that the virus can be transmitted via airborne and not just via surfaces, 
or aerosol droplets. What measures do we need to have in place or consider? I think going back, it's those seven things. I think if it, if we can make sure that we follow each and every one of those seven things, we know that transmission is can be minimal. And I think with the mask, it's important whether it's droplets, whether you're looking at aerosols. That graph with the um, with the data suggested that if someone was wearing a mask, really there was nothing that was being transmitted. And again, coming from the healthcare setting, having to be in a high risk where you know taking care of these patients, um, being in the hospital multiple times, you know, um, in a week and, and being next to a patient and following every single, you know, I think some of those are not always followed. Again, I have to examine a patient. I can't socially distance and say, yep, you look great, you know, but it's the other measures. Once those measures are are combined, it's very safe. And that's why we say you can't just pick and choose one or the other. It has to be all. And, and we know that there are going to be gaps in one here or one there. It's that Swiss cheese thing. Is it Not everything is perfect. Not everything can be done 100%. But as long as you do all of those things, you can make sure that there's prevention and, and minimal risk. Thank you. Uh, what rooms are you recommending to have HEPA filtration in addition to the building HVAC? I'm happy to answer if Angie wants to jump in too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. You know, we use a risk stratified approach. So definitely the nurse's room and the nurse and the isolation room for where sick kids are going to be. And then if there's any other rooms that are small and um, and there's going to be you know, uh, you know, potentially more people in that space with masks off. So I'm thinking about yesterday, we talked about some of those therapy rooms and the speech therapist's room is somewhat small and she's got the plexiglass and all that, but rooms like that would also need to have a, a portable HEPA filtration. So it's really gonna take an assessment uh, of, of all your rooms to really decide for sure. But using that risk-based approach um, will get you what you need. Um, in your recommendations, you talked about um, COVID-19 supervisors. Can you explain what a COVID-19 supervisor would do specifically? Sure, I can. I can take that one too. Um, you know the. Washington Department of Health and all of their uh, mitigation strategies, whether it's schools or businesses, because we've also helped several businesses and churches open up. And even in the church guidelines recommends, Washington DOH recommends a COVID supervisor. And that COVID supervisor is somebody that has extra training uh, around uh, COVID-19 and all seven of these mitigation strategies. They, you know, are, you know, we actually provide training for that. They know how to do the EPA review on products. Um, they're just somebody that has extra content um, I, I liken it to a mini me of us in a way, you know, they have a little bit extra knowledge. They're a point person that's been designated that people can go to with questions to help them figure out some of these nuances, whether it's trying to figure out social distancing in their in your classroom or or should I have a plexiglass or that type of thing. Um, so just somebody with that extra knowledge that people know who they are and, and can get that extra information. Great. Thank you. So when do student desks become considered high touch surfaces? And what part of the student desks are high touch surfaces? Just the tops or the rest of it as well? It all depends on what the student's doing. I think that, um, you know, every kid is different. Some kids just have their space on their desk and they don't touch other things. But I think the high touch surface is if you can include definitely the top of the desk, but anything that where they may touch um, is something that I would say that that gets cleaned and disinfected prior to the next one um, coming on. Um, okay, next question. Can kids use the district provided Oxivir TB wipes or just staff? And can these wipes be used when the kids are in the room, but not at the same table? 
I think there was, I think John, you were able to get some of the clarification from um, the LNI is yes, yeah, so kids and staff can, kids in sixth grade onward um, can use these wipes and clean their area. The younger kids, um, I don't believe that LNI is recommending that. What we are, rec the Oxivir TB wipes are hydrogen peroxide based and um, you know, we've we've said it multiple times as far as the safety for these goes at zero 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 meaning they're not harmful and that I, like I had mentioned that that is one product that you don't need to wear gloves for because it breaks down into oxygen and hydrogen. All of those are natural elements and there's not any significant chemicals. So those can be used um, and are very safe um, for both the kids sixth grade and older and um, staff to use. Hey, thank you. Uh, do teachers need to replace cloth slash fabric covered teacher chairs or other furniture in the classroom? If it's their personal chair, no, they do not. Um, if it's a chair that's being shared with others, then you might wanna reconsider that. But if it's their own personal chair, no. And that's because fabric's not a cleanable surface. You can't clean and disinfect it. You can clean it, let me back that up. You can clean it, but you cannot disinfect it because fabric is porous. And so that's why uh, we say hard surface chairs for any sort of chair that's going to be shared between other people. And then that way it can be cleaned and disinfected in between. What about vinyl covered uh, furniture? Vinyl covered, as long as it's not cracked, is totally is considered a hard surface and that is appropriate. Great question, John, because in many schools uh, in areas like the weight room, um, oftentimes you're gonna find a lot of cracked vinyl surfaces in those spaces. So that'll be a, a risk assessment that you guys will want to do um, before you open is, is check those areas and make sure you don't have any cracked vinyl surfaces because otherwise germs can tra get trapped in that. It, you know, once the vinyl breaks open, it becomes a porous surface because it's soft material under there and it'll trap uh, not only viruses, but bacteria as well. And so, yeah, you might want to get those repaired uh, and not don't repair them with duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, can Vindicator be sprayed when there are kids in the room and are there additional precautions that should be taken? You know what, I can pull up Vindicator, but John, do you want to touch base a little bit on that one? And I can, you know, I'll pull it up on our products list. It is one of our approved products, but I don't have that one committed to heart like I do Oxivir. Absolutely. So yes, uh, Vindicator can be utilized while students are in the classroom. Students are just not allowed to utilize it themselves or handle it. Um, the teacher needs to be the one that sprays it and wipes it if that's the product that's being used. And gloves right. should be worn when using Vindicator. Right, and, and you, uh, I can't type and talk. Okay, there's the list, that'll help. I was gonna share um, because I was super impressed with this product. I wasn't aware of this product until we walked your schools and, and John shared it with us. Um, but it's, it's labeled um, a couple of different ways. And so um, it's also called morning mist. Um, and then it's also called neutral 64. And many of the Lewis County schools use neutral 64. So basically it's the same product. And um, once it is in its diluted form, it has minimal safety ratings. And so it's not zero, zero, zero like Oxivir, but it is one, zero, zero. And so under normal use, PPE is not required with that product. But yes, because of the fact that it needs to be diluted, uh, it is, and used with a, with, with a, a wipe um, or typically a, um, a, microfiber rag, then we, we always like to leave that to the janitors or whoever's been properly trained in use of the product. And it's got a, what, contact time of 10 minutes, which is another, you know, challenge with that particular product is the surface has to stay wet for 10 minutes. And to be clear that the Vindicator that's 
in the buildings for staff to use is already diluted. Um, it's the custodians handle it in non-diluted form. Oh, perfect, perfect. So you just need to maintain that 10 minute contact time and use microfiber with that product. So the next question is, how do exterior windows and doors being open help with ventilation? And how much do they need to be open? And last, is there specific times such as lunch that this would be most helpful? All of the above, really. Um, as you know, the C CDC, you know, fresh air is best no matter what. So that's what it's really all about is increasing the amount of fresh air in the building. And I know John's done a lot of that work with maximizing that on the HVAC side, um, but anytime you can also open a window or crack a door open to increase that airflow of fresh air is always best. How much, um, just as long as it's cracked, as much as you can tolerate it, but yet it's that time of the year where it's cold, right? So you need to balance that a little bit. And if you need to use, you know, using a more risk-based approach is appropriate with opening it at if you're if the kids are eating in the classroom cracking the door open during that time because the kids are unmasked would be an ideal time to have that outside door cracked open i think the other thing to keep in mind um that uh in, you know in terms of the hvac system right now uh you, you know the the hvac system for your building is designed for maximum occupancy and right now you're not at maximum occupancy. So you're getting basically twice the airflow, if not more, um, uh, because you have, you know, less bodies in that in those spaces. So really um, airflow uh, with the HVAC system as well as cracking windows and doors is maximized. And uh, so, you know, you guys are, are well taken care of when it comes to that portion of the Swiss cheese. Thank you. So the next question may actually be for John, but um, we have been told in the past that leaving doors open makes the ventilation system not work properly. We have always been told to not prop doors open. Also, is it a safety concern to have the doors propped open? John, do you want to take that one? <laughs> or I'm happy to take that. <laughs> sure. So yeah, uh, anytime you prop a door or a window open, you're going to find that your HVAC is um, going to be less efficient. And it's going to utilize more energy to heat and cool that space um, because you're letting in cold air or letting in hot air or, or like, sending that air out. Um, however, for as far as ventilation goes, you're going to see some improvement because you're going to have fresh air um, being uh, removed or brought into that space rather than um, recycled. So, um, and efficiency wise, yes, that's an issue. Um, but for ventilation, it does improve that, that air as well. Um, there is always that security factor. And so that's really going to have to be a, a teacher decision and, and how comfortable they feel with leaving that door open. Um, and just probably being more mindful of your surroundings will be really important during that time. Um, okay, so last question is, how often should common surfaces such as teacher's tables, restroom doorknobs, student desks, and chairs be cleaned, sanitized, or disinfected? I think Great. it all depends on the use, too. I mean, all yeah. of those things that you have mentioned are high-touch surfaces, but by various different ways. So, I mean, I think um, for kids' desks, if the same kid is staying in the classroom, then, you know, then they're there, it's their germs. It probably needs to happen before and after, um, you know, the day starts. It's different if kids are going in and out of different classrooms because then there's multiple different people or kids that are touching that same desk. So that may be depending on every time that there's a new child coming onto that desk, that desk needs to be cleaned. Um, you know, as far as doorknobs and things like that, I know that, um, your team has a phenomenal plan as to what, how often that should be done. So I would follow that plan. The main thing is, you know, that hand hygiene. So not all doorknobs are clean. I mean, we go to the grocery store, we go other places in the public where things are not clean, but it's on us to do that hand hygiene. So that's where the hand hygiene portion will come 
in making sure that yes, the surfaces are being cleaned multiple times a day, but you're also doing the part of doing the hand hygiene too. Absolutely, and the and the CDC does not define um, the frequency. They recommend what they say is daily and more frequent. Um, and so they really leave the decision of frequency up to the unique needs of the organization, the school, the facility, and to define what that routine practice is going to be. That's more than daily. And so John has defined that there for you guys. And, uh, you know, we've we totally approve that. And in fact, his approach is a best practice because it not only includes high touch surfaces, it includes the bathrooms. And so those areas are getting cleaned at least twice a day, if not more. So. All right, well, thank you very much. That brings us to 3.30, which is our closing time. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I'll let Crest and close things up, but I just want to personally thank you guys for all the support and help that you've done uh, coming out to our buildings twice now and, and really going through the facilities and seeing what we're doing and, and helping us do a better job. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Well, we appreciate the opportunity and, and thank you for inviting us into your spaces. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just for everybody, you guys are doing a great job. I think that we're, we're probably reinforcing what you already know and not um, giving you any new information. So I will say you guys have been great to work with as well and, and uh, have done great. Well, I would also like to echo and say thank you very much. It's really a, a great thing to know that if we do have questions in this uncertain time, because really none of us, I, I do not have a degree in reopening schools during a pandemic. Uh, and we want to do it the right way and we want to do it the safest way. So thank you for your expertise in that. And I just wanna reiterate to the staff on this, um, on this call that um, if questions pop up or you're thinking, you know, you're rearranging your room or you're thinking, I just don't know how to do this correctly, then uh, please go to your supervisor and or principal and put the question, you know, and give the question to them and then John and Heidi will be the main uh, communicator with our IPAC consultants. And I know that you have said that as we open up and we have students in, you would be more than happy to come through, uh, especially if there's specific groups that really want um, your expertise eyes on there. Mm -hmm. So I just wanna really um, thank you for your collaboration and your willingness to come out. Um, you guys have really been great. And our Lewis County School District say nothing but wonderful things about you. And they've been open. Um, and their high schools and their middle school and their elementaries are open. And they mm -hmm. are not seeing, they're not seeing outbreaks amongst their, their students or their staff. Uh, not that, that they don't have true. COVID cases, but they are not seeing spread. Correct. True, and th that is absolutely correct, Creston. And thank you for bringing that up. And we've partnered with other schools uh, outside of Lewis County as well, and um, and it's been the same experience. So, you know, following every element of you know those seven things and having an you know, the exposure plan that Heidi, you know, has uh, when you do have a positive case, um, you know. That'll, that'll keep you guys as safe as possible and, and minimize risk to the bare minimum. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for allowing us to go a little bit over and just know that we will have a continued partnership. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you guys. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.